Good evening, this is Tom Brennan. Recently it was my pleasure to be a guest of the National Archive at Washington, D.C., where I uncovered a rare kinescope of Henry Miller appearing on the Caddy Dupont show in 1960. We retrieved this kinescope, and I feel it's something that is too earth-shatteringly important not to share with my audience. So tonight, Studio 13 presents a show we like to entitle Henry Miller Predicts. Oh, good morning, America. What a lovely spring day it is in New York City. This morning, you might say I'm being just a tad naughty in bringing to you a guest who's quite controversial. This morning, it's my pleasure to bring to you Mr. Henry Miller. Now, Henry Miller is the famous expatriate writer who relocated into Paris, France, and authored works such as Tropic of Cancer, Tropic of Capricorn, Black Spring, many other books that have been banned not only abroad, but here in this great nation of ours. Now, I think it's going to be quite interesting to ask Mr. Miller what he thinks upon returning to the United States. Uh, he's staying now in Big Sur, California, and was nice enough to fly in to be a guest on our show. And I'd like to begin now by asking Mr. Miller, what do you think are going to be the coming trends? Well, in the 1960s, what things will people be interested in? What will I be interested in? What will you be interested in? What will we as a people, as Americans, be doing in the 1960s? Is there hope for us? Well, Kitty, 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 whatever your name is, I come here today to repudiate some of these charges that have been brought against me as being a writer of dirty books. The thing I like to do in my works is celebrate life. The love of the body, the good, healthy love of the body, of man and woman. Man and woman joining together as uh, in a common sensual bond. Maybe it goes against the grain of America. Because what I see happening here in America today, and in the coming years, is a paramilitary situation. I see the police gaining more power and the military gaining more power. We've seen through the 1950s, from my vantage point, all of America gearing up as some kind of giant beast, some kind of oppressive totalitarian state, and I think this is all very, very unhealthy. You know, I'm a student and follower of Wilhelm Reich, the uh, psychologist who's been outlawed recently and put in the federal penitentiary. Wilhelm maintains that repression of the sexual organs and sexuality in humans is the thing that leads to fascist repression. He used as a case in point Mussolini's Italy. And being in Europe in the 1930s and 40s, I saw a lot of the coming fascism that was growing then. And it was all due to the same thing, a big crackdown by the state. Repression of people's bodies and thoughts. I mean free love and freeing yourself and your spirit inside is in the greatest American tradition uh, of radical writers like Emerson and uh, Thoreau and all those kind of guys. What I think will be coming in the uh, next few years, I hate to say, is uh, p men replacing the healthy sexual organs with a love of guns. Using gu what are guns anyway? All they do is destroy. They don't create nothing. You know what I'm saying? Don't you know that guns are just a trap? I think if we get rid of the guns and the, the emphasis on destruction and this, uh, this debased notion of manhood that we've been fostering here in the United States for the last few years under Eisenhower, I mean, we can't be the world's policemen. If you end up being a policeman, you're like the cop on the beat in New York City in Brooklyn's old Fifth Ward where I grew up, you know, and the, the cops had a rough time because people knew these John Bulls for what they were. They were repressed. When I first went to Paris, what I found there was a freedom, a freedom of the body, a freedom of young men and women meeting each other and engaging in various sexual situations that you don't see go on here that often under our puritanical, rigid, repressed guise of uh, religiosity that's a carryover from the Puritans, who themselves were very misled as to what they were doing here in the first place. I think essentially, Big Brother is tapping us on the shoulder and trying to, to push us towards true repression. Mr. Miller, this is most distressing to hear on a lovely morning like this in New York City. How can you say these things? Well, I think, Caddy, what we're, what we're seeing is, is this very attitude that you're presenting here. I mean, you've got to loosen up, you know. Here, here I've come to America. I come back to America. I have a lovely wife from Europe. I went through a lot of experiences there that changed the man profoundly. And what I see in the coming years, again, as I say, is America is like a roving night beast. What you've seen in, in literature, uh, the European sensibilities, such as Genet and Louis Ferdinand Celine and some of these characters, is that they're viewing America as a place where 
The nighttime itself is like a giant devouring beast full of confused lights, uh, strange figures in the night. Figures that look like robots or some strange thing out of a Fritz Lang movie. Roving bands of uh, paramilitary police just uh, at will going amongst the people and destroying private property and confiscating and, uh, and creating a whole atmosphere. An ironclad grip of repression that's coming down on our heads, it's choking off our vitality. And again, I say the root of this problem is, is the fear of sexuality. We've got, we've got to be free. I don't say uh, nudie camps. There's one right near me in Big Sur. I don't frequent it, but I say you've got to liberate the body. You've got to get in touch with your real male essence and let it, let it be a thing that rainbows out of you in a shuddering, shimmering arc of truth and vitality. It's a revitalizing current, the sexual orgones that we release. And uh, Otherwise, we're going to get into this kind of phase of humanity where people are just running scared. And what are they running scared from? Themselves. And when people are running scared from themselves, they react in very, very strange ways. They start, it's the old question of what makes a man start fires. It's this primitive art, the destructive power we contain within ourselves and have to channel into healthier things. You know, knocking around Paris in the old days, it was a much freer, freer situation than we have here. And we're going to see here in the next coming years. I mean, sure, the John Doms would roust you just a little bit if you were sleeping on a park bench near the Seine. But that's nothing compared to all this fingerprinting and cataloging and, and uh, grinding people under the boot heel. And I think that's what they want to implement here, is grinding people under the boot heel. And how are people going to react when they're pushed to the wall like this? I know when I was in Paris, I did some desperate things myself. You know, I'd, I'd steal a few cigarettes uh, or, or pens or, you know, a typewriter, but, but never nothing like... Uh, the repression that's coming down on the people here, I think they're going to react like wild animals in a cage. Because when you treat man like an animal, what, are you gonna, what is he going to do? He has no choice. When all the choices are taken away from people, they're going to take to the streets and they're going to they're gonna burn down things. Their anger is going to be the only expression that they know anymore. You take away a man's creativity and educational process when you limit them and their reactions to society and, and where they fit in. I tell you, it's, uh, it's really going to be a rough situation, Caddy. Mr. Miller, I, I don't mean to interrupt your flow here, but isn't this rather alarmist? I mean, after all, this is America, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Didn't our forefathers fight and scratch tooth and nail inch by inch to recover this, what was once a wilderness of savages, and convert it into a wonderful, wonderful marketplace of goods and services available to everybody? Well, yeah, well, yeah, Caddy, I know you're buying the whole American line hook, line, and sinker, but didn't I write a book called The Air-Conditioned Nightmare? And that's what we're living in here. I mean, sure, you have all the modern conveniences, like they say in England, all mod cons. And I think con is what it really is. They're pulling the wool over your eyes. I mean, every day the police are getting the goods on good, honest people and cracking down. I mean, you had the FBI... Uh, trying to investigate all these nice young men, the beat generation, who I think are real protean changelings, a whole new mode of mankind upon the face of the earth. I mean, these guys like Kerouac and Ginsburg are railing against what I see as the injustices. The modern-day Emersons and Thoreau's, they're cut from the same bolt of cloth that those great philosophers were. And I think Ginsburg taking off his clothes and Kerouac speaking of the freedoms of the open road, this is a healthy thing for the young, the young kids to get into. I know a lot of girls are gravitating to their movement because it offers them a chance to wear dark clothes and, and heavy eyeliner and act all European and feline and act like subterranean night creatures who are very sexual and uh, resplendent in their own sexuality. And I think this is an important thing. I think we need to rekindle this essential uh, sexual gravitation between humans. We've got to get crotches synchronized, not watches synchronized. I think... Uh, Caddy, you surely can follow me. You used to be on Broadway. You used to be a bright young star. I know you're no stranger to sexual situations. And uh, if you read my works, I think they'll pull your coat and put you in the know-how about how we can regenerate in, uh, a whole new America. Mr. Miller, we'd like to take a pause now in your monologue to bring you our sponsor, United Carrot Corporation of America. Carrots. Just picture their wholesome, loving goodness of carrots. This splendid tubular object I hold in my hand has been plucked from the earth. Carrots are the most delicious, nutritious, appetizing ingredient in one's menu. If you look at our whole United States, don't you realize that a full one-third of our great land is carrot country? Gosh, carrot country! 
carrots growing everywhere, sprouting up, lifting their heads towards the sun and wholesome goodness for everybody. I love to go down to the market or even go down to a little truck stand and get myself carrots, nothing but carrots. Is it any wonder they're called carrots? Like 24 carat gold they are, jam-packed with tons of wholesome, juicy, delicious goodness for you. Squeeze them. I like to put them close to my crotch, where I can feel them engulf me in their revitalizing vitality and deliciousness. I love the green stalks, holding them up. It feels so pubic, this green stalk. Doesn't it make you just vibrate with inner wonderful wisdom? The carrot, the king of foods. Maybe the king of the world. Carrots, the most delicious thing known to man. Carrots have no known bad effects. You can pull the tops off them, you can grind them, you can splice them, you can dice them, you can eat them. You can do whatever you want with carrots. Delicious, wholesome, good carrots. Good-natured, friendly, lovely, warm, radiant carrots. I love to buy four or five at a time and just hold them and squeeze them and caress them. There is nothing like a carrot to start your day off just right. I like to pack them away in the freezer so I can take them on long journeys with me in my Winnebago. Nothing but carrots. Thank you very much, Al. Now, Mr. Miller, we were speaking of many of these topics that are concerning me at this point. You seem to have a, a almost radical slant. No, I, I think what you see here is the wisdom I learned hard on the streets of Brooklyn. I mean, what you see nowadays is the, the whole white people, in the, all through the 1950s, just turning a deaf ear to black folks. The neighbors, our black brothers and sisters. I mean, you have artists like Thelonious Monk and Miles Davis. The, these people are, are as unto us African kings. They're shedding an incredible knowledge and wisdom about how to live on the earth. And what are we doing to all these fine young black children? We're not educating them, we're putting them in jails is what we're doing. We're putting them behind bars. Now you can only push people so far, Caddy. You sit up there in your biggest state in Long Island, uh, Dutchess County, wherever you live, you don't know what's going on down here. And this is what I see as a trend in the coming years. This repression against black people is going to backfire on us all. Oh, Mr. Miller, you make it sound so grim. But when I was on the President's Council for Education, I met many Negroes and I felt they were very nice people. Now we must pause for something even more interesting. In the 60s, I think a coming trend will be sex change. Tonight, we have a distinguished longshoreman, head of the local Teamsters Union on the Hoboken docks, Turk Dombrowski. Turk, I'd like to ask you how you drifted into this whole passion for women's clothing and how you yourself became a woman. Well, I've always had an affinity for women's clothes. Uh, I find it no impediment to my existence to to jump right into a nice frilly nylon night slip or, or garter belt, or especially black nylons like the Parisian women wear. And you know, it doesn't work against me on the docks either, because uh, my fellow longshoremen, Local 147, like it. Oh, I find that absolutely enchanting. Is there a certain designer that you follow uh, now that you're a woman? A certain fashion? Uh... Well, I, I like Gavanchi quite a bit. I think he does a good job. He's solid. Oh, that's most interesting, because I myself own many Givenchy gowns. Uh, did you see his show last year uh, here in New York City? Were you able to attend? Uh, or is it something that you'd rather stay away from, being a man? No, I find that I'm, uh, uh, I'm not a cross-dresser, too. I want to get that across. I am actually a woman. I've had the operation now. Uh, much like Christine Jorgensen was a pioneer trailblazer in the great American tradition, I myself went down there to the clinic, and I got myself changed around into, into, into a more, uh, more desirable setting for myself because I always wanted to be a woman and feel life as a woman, you see. That is most fascinating. Here is the president of the local Longshoremen's Union, and it turns out he is a woman. Perhaps this will be a coming trend in the years ahead. Is this something we must fear? I should think not. I think it's just marvelous on this beautiful spring day in New York City. Just a lovely, lovely thing. Good evening and welcome to Critics Corner. Thank you, thank you very much, Caddy, for letting me be a part of your show once again for our Tuesday segment. I'm Baby Jane Falkenberg, cinema critic for The Village Voice. 